Yo, 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 here we are. Some may consider it procrastination. I consider it science communication. My name is Caden Howlett. If we haven't met, I am a PhD student at the University of Arizona, and I study the process of mountain building. How do mountains like the Andes and the Rockies form? It's as simple as that. We think about really broad scale stuff in the subdiscipline that I do. However, it is, it is grounded first and foremost in field geology. That is to say, the acquisition of field-based observational data. And that being said, as a geologist, you collect a lot of rocks, right? And a common question that geologists get is like, you must have a huge rock collection. Uh, you must be able to identify like every gem and mineral on earth. <laughs> in, in fact, that's not the case but we do accumulate rocks over time. And I had an idea for this video of sharing with you the rocks that I have in my apartment. And I think it, if you've been on the channel before and you know me, it might surprise you to know that I don't actually have that many rocks. The rocks that I do have, however, mean a lot to me and they mean a lot geologically. They're significant in terms of um, the questions that drive me, the unanswered, the unanswered tectonic questions that dwell inside. And so this is gonna be a short video because I don't have that many rocks, but the purpose is to show you them. And so we're just gonna walk around. I've done absolutely no preparation. I haven't laid anything out. I uh, <laughs> haven't reviewed any notes. So hopefully I can remember uh, what these things are. But yeah, let's just walk around my apartment, see what we got. I don't want to show you too much of my house, actually. Well, I have a lot of trinkets, you know, and just disregard those. That's maybe a story for another day. Maybe you could have cleaned up a little bit. Um, yeah, okay, we'll start here. Our first rock that we picked up here, you know, might not be the most interesting thing you've ever seen, but it might actually be one of the most interesting uh, rocks in terms of geological processes. This is a schist. You might be able to see some of that um, fabric in there. Schists are characterized, as you may know, if you're like an undergrad geologist, for example, by the parallel or sub-parallel alignment of minerals like mica, like muscovite and biotite. This causes this, this, oh! <laughs> this causes this um, schistose fabric you know, thinly layered, peels off really easily. So this is the Oricopia schist. This rock um, is extremely interesting tectonically. Listen to me very carefully when I say this. This is a metamorphic rock. It's under, it's, it's experienced relatively high temperatures and pressures. This rock was deposited as sediments um, basically in an ocean basin, in a trench, we call it. Subsequently, these sediments and sedimentary rocks were subducted underneath the southwest margin of the United States or North America um, under modern California, Southern California. And then they were re-exhumed to the surface. So basically this was a, was a sedimentary rock that accumulated in the ocean, was pushed underneath the continent by uh, plate tectonics, subduction, on, you know, oceanic lithosphere going down and then it was exhumed to the surface by, by um, processes that people are still trying to figure out. So in a very, very short period of time, geologically speaking, this rock got shoved underneath a continent and was exhumed out of it. The Oricopia Schist, I highly recommend reading about that if you haven't heard about it. All right, what else do we got behind me? Okay, this is a simple one. All Keep in mind, all of these are very meaningful to me. This is just a beautiful piece of vesicular basalt. This is from the Big Island of Hawaii. I actually filmed a video um, exploring the world's largest lava tube. And that is from uh, the Big Island, just a very recent, like this is from a lava flow in the 1970s, I think. So just a young, cool souvenir. I'm here in no particular order here. Moenkopi formation. I collected this during my undergraduate field camp. 
These are called oscillatory ripples. The Moen Kopi was deposited in a shallow, or at least partially deposited in a shallow sea environment tidal. Um, and in these tidal environments, you have wave action that goes in uh, both directions, two directions, let's say, primarily. And that creates what are known as oscillatory ripples. These are characterized by basic uh, symmetry across the ripple crest. Whereas if you have flow in a fluvial system, river system, for example, that's all going in one direction, you're gonna develop some asymmetry to your ripples. These don't have that. The Moen Kopi. It's Triassic, I think. I hope it's Triassic. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Amazing rock right here. Take a look at that, think about it. Pretty, pretty common. Think continental crust, think Yosemite. Granite. <laughs> um, you see those big salmon colored potassium feldspar crystals. This I collected in Southern Tibet. This is part of the Gangdizi Batholith. These are, these are granitic plutons that are, they can be thought of as a similar, uh, having a similar origin to something like uh, the Sierra Nevada batholith. That is to say the gr granites in Yosemite, they formed um, as a result of subduction of oceanic lithosphere beneath Southern Eurasia prior to the collision of India with Asia. So this rock means a lot to me. It's a very just common, normal granite that you'd see, but I love it. All right, moving down the line, we're going to another continent. This is was collected just a couple weeks ago. Can anyone guess? This is a serpentinite. This is a piece of oceanic, former oceanic lithosphere that got trapped in between um, the Adriatic microplate and Southern Europe, I guess, during the creation of the Alps. I think it was known as the, the LPO, the Ligurian Piedmont Ocean Basin, got pinched in between uh, this big continental collision system. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a beautiful piece of oceanic crust that got trapped up in a continental collision zone. You can see it has that shiny luster to it. It's all sheared up and messed up. This is, uh-oh, my Biggie Smalls statue. If you know, you know. I'm going, going back, back to Cali, Cali. <laughs> Great. Okay, moving down the line. I just sat here. I have no idea if the light is good, but thanks for watching. This is, a piece, this is also from Southern Tibet. This is a piece of the Lhasa terrain, as we call it. This is a metasedimentary rock, mostly sedimentary. Um, I do not know much about the what the Lhasa terrain is made of, to be completely honest with you. But this is just a beautiful interbedded siltstone and limestone uh, marine rock, I guess. Clearly don't know that much about it, but I collected it at like almost 6,000 meters above sea level with my buddy. Kurt Sundell and collaborator. I love you, Kurt. Um, all right, we're gone. We're still on the same shelf. Calcite crystals. We're getting real crystalled out out here. Uh, this is from Bridger Canyon, Southwest Montana. Super common in when you're like scrambling around in the in the passive margin rocks like the the Mississippi and Madison group. Uh, Mission Canyon, Lodgepole, Limestone, stuff like that. There's a ton of this um, like prismatic crystal and calcite precipitated in various veins and whatnot. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, cool. Well, that's all we've got on those shelves. We have something up here. On one side, it might look like a boring calcareous siltstone, deep marine rock. And then I might turn it around and reveal to you a beautiful ammonite fossil. This is from the mid-Jurassic Lamanga formation in the South Central Andes. I collected this with my buddy Chance Ronimus. He must have one as well. 
Good old ammonite sea creatures, baby. Oh, this is cool. This is a piece of the Kailash formation, bleh, formation Kailash in southern Tibet. <clears throat> Very interesting. This is just like a pebbly sandstone that I picked up. And you can see I have a little K on there. Um, obviously, this rock is like so standard. It's just a common like coarse very coarse sandstone with pebbles, whatever. Um, but it has a lot of meaning tectonically. The origin of this basin that these rocks were deposited in um, is, let's say, still debated. Interesting tectonic questions having to do with the dynamics of subducted Indian Oceanic lithosphere. Um, I love my rocks from Tibet they mean a lot to me cool well we'll walk around we'll see what else we got in the house okay we're over at the bookshelf now this is just a random I've had this rock a really long time this is a piece probably of some Cambrian quartzite but it it was contact metamorphosed against um, some intrusives up Little Cottonwood Canyon in Utah these intrusives, I think they're just kind of, um, or at least where this was collected, it's referred to as the Alta stock, basically an altered quartzite that was really close to an intruding body of granite. This is a special rock up here. I didn't even know this was up here. This is probably the most valuable rock I have, truthfully. This is called Highlight Opal. And you might be able to get a feel for it. The reason this is valuable is because that's a lot of opal. And I'm talking about just that stuff on the surface of this basalt, or I guess andesite, from Highlight Canyon, a really famous locality in uh, southwest Montana near Bozeman. Something interesting about Highlight Opal is that it has trace amounts of uranium, relatively high trace amounts. And if you put a black light on this stuff, it glows like iridescent or not iridescent but fluorescent green and it maintains some of that after you take the light off of it so my highlight opal specimen means a lot to me love the rock kind of want to make a piece of jewelry out of that someday all right i'm keeping you looking at the floor because i don't want you to get too comfortable in my house this is just a nice like cubic cubic pyrite kind of cool this is a just a river stone from the middle fork of the flathead where i used to work northwest montana this is belt super group rock speaking of the belt super group this is my favorite rock i own everybody this is three separate stromatolite heads from the middle Proterozoic belt supergroup that I just mentioned. These stromatolites, if you don't know, these are cyanobacterial mats that have been around billions of years, literally, um, still living in the oceans today. Basically, it's kind of hard to get with this light, but when these things grow, they'll, they'll develop a mat of, of cyanobacteria or algae, and then some sediment will accumulate and then it'll continue that over and over. So they develop these somewhat concentrically ringed fossils. So this rock means a lot to me. It's huge and I've carried it around a lot. In fact, I sampled it when I was on a way up in the wilderness on a rafting trip and I kept it. So that's my stromatolite. I had two rocks above my sink. This is just a nice like, out of context kinematic indicator, what I guess you'd call a delta clast from the Spanish Peaks region of Southwest Montana. Um, this is Archean in age, maybe 2.8 billion years old. <laughs> Great. This one actually has the name on it. This is a carbonate from the Newland Formation. This is also the Belt Supergroup, but it comes from my field area in the Little Belt Mountains. You can see it's just a it's just a micrite, a carbonate mud that is cross cut by a lot of um, calcite veins. So kind of interesting. 
Oh, I have a gigantic piece of selenite that I didn't collect, but I just think that it brings me peace and happiness. So got that. And you know, everybody, I think that's all you're gonna get today. Thank you for watching everybody. I hope you're having a great week. Work hard, attack, smile, breathe through your nose, tell someone hello who you've never met and hug someone that you love. Ciao.